I hope you had a great weekend and you're rested and you're ready to get back on top of your week. We're very excited here at Best Practice Live for this Monday. We've got a very special presentation for you today. Today we're going to look at the doctor-recommended treatments for knee pain. You know, a lot of us, if you have a problem, you have questions, questions like, hey, what's the worst this could be? Is this an emergency? Should I be, fl should I be surfing the web or should I be in the car on the way to the emergency room? Or I'm just overwhelmed by the number of uh, choices that I'm seeing online. What do I do next? What's the expected time course of this? And then we get into the nitty gritty, like what are my actual options? What could be wrong with me? And what should I be doing about it? We're gonna look at all of those things today for knee pain, and we're gonna devote every Monday this month to going over the big five, that's neck pain, shoulder pain, low back pain, knee and hip pain, here on Best Practice Live. Well, let's dig into it. Today we're gonna to talk about knee pain and what I really wanna impart upon you, if it's you or someone you love or even someone you just know and wanna have something smart to say to about knee pain, I want you to get a sense of what's expected. You know, back when I was a practicing doctor, I saw 20,000, 22,000 actually patients during my career. And the one thing I think every, everybody is different, everybody had their own take on their issue, but the one thing every single person had in common was a desire to know, hey, is this normal? Not is this normal, because I'm dealing with something abnormal like knee pain, but is what's happening to me what should be happening, or do I need to do something different? And it's funny because virtually every time the answer to that question was no, you're totally off course. There is a course, there is an expected pattern of treatment, and that's what we're gonna go over today. What's supposed to happen when you have knee pain? I'm gonna to present to you some timeline, and sometimes it's gonna be confusing because I'm gonna make it seem like I'm talking about the number of weeks since you first experienced pain, but what I need you to substitute in your mind is the number of weeks since you decided to pursue treatment. So if your knee pain, if your knee started hurting five years ago, but you didn't decide until today to pursue treatment, then when you hear me talking about this stuff, today is day zero, because all that prior stuff really doesn't, doesn't count. That was a bad choice when looking back on it, right? We were kind of floundering and, and uh, waiting and, and hoping it would just go away. And, uh, you know, we don't do that in any other part of our lives. If our car starts making a loud knocking noise and smoke comes under, out from under the hood, nobody's like, oh, I'll just keep driving it and see what happens. <laughs> you know, we don't do that. But when we can barely walk and the knee hurts so bad every day we wake up, it's so stiff, it takes 10 minutes to get out of bed, and then it barely loosens up as time goes by, and we've stopped running, we've stopped hiking, we've stopped going to events with people we love, we, we go through a period of loss rather than just pursue straightforward traditional treatment that we know works for our problem. Why do we do that? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm here to make it stop. Let's, no, we're not doing that anymore. Let's move on and get the right treatment at the right time. And I'm gonna show you what to expect and who delivers it and put you at ease about how to go through this process. So again, times, dates, stamps, don't get hung up on that. We're talking about the time since it started. All right, let's hit the screen and start with the beginning, which is the pain starts. Now, this is time zero, pain begins. And um, this really, the, all musculoskeletal issues have to start with a red flag survey. A red flag survey is where you ask yourself, what are the worst things this could be? And another way of putting that question is, 
what are the things that if I don't get treatment right now, the delay in treatment is going to hurt me? The delay in treatment could make me worse. And under the worst case circumstances, a delay in treatment could actually lead to long-term harm or even death for me. The big ones, uh, the red flags, the, the, the big baddies, that by the way, you don't have. 99.99% of people with knee pain, you have something else that we're gonna talk about. But there's that tiny 0.01% of you that are gonna have something like a tumor or an infection, a septic knee, or you have, um, you have a, a fracture and an unstable knee. You've injured yourself and your knee, by you, unstable means by using it, you're doing, your knee is no longer, has the internal structure to protect itself and you're actually making yourself permanently damaged by using it. Those are the things we have to watch out for. Those are the things, a septic knee, if you don't get that thing treated, you can, you can really develop permanent damage and the sepsis can spread to the rest of your body. It can be very, very serious matter. So how do you know if you have one of these very rare things that needs immediate care? Well, you do a red flag survey. And a red flag survey is, number one, is my knee pain so bad that I really can't even walk on it following an accident? Is my knee pain so bad that I can't even walk on it following an accident? But accident because that raises the question of, do I have an unstable knee? A knee that is not internally strong enough to protect itself, to protect you during everyday usage. Second, if you've had a history of cancer, if you've had prostate cancer or breast cancer, there are some that are just more frequent than others to metastasize to bone. You could have a primary bone tumor, uh, but it's very, very rare, and it's gonna come out in the course of other things. But if you have one of these, if you have a history of a known cancer and you start having any kind of weird symptom, you have to assume first, gosh, could this be the cancer? Because if it is, we're gonna need to deal with that. And then you would wanna see your oncologist right away. And then the third thing is, uh, could it be an infection? Because infection would be associated with symptoms of infection. What are the symptoms of infection? fevers, shakes, and chills. So if you were to develop knee or any other joint pain associated with fever, shakes, and chills, that those, those things don't go together except in sepsis. You could just happen to be getting sick at the same time you happen to be getting arthritis, but that's unlikely. So if you get joint pain associated with fever, shakes, and chills, that's a giant red flag. If you want a checklist of these red flags, pop over to phoenixspineandjoint.com under resources, link through on the video, and you can get a downloaded checklist where you can spend the time to look at them one by one. So stop catastrophizing. If you think your knee hurts so bad that you're gonna die, then you need to do that. You're not gonna die. The odds of this are extremely unlikely. But let's, let's get that out. If you're one of those people that that's where you're at, let's say people might even sometimes call you a little bit on the neurotic side, like so many people in my family. Well, if that's the way you are, then stop, do the red flag survey, and let's move on from there. Otherwise, for the other 99.99% of us, let's move on and forget the red flags now because we're done, we don't have any, and talk about treatment at home. Let's go back to the viewer. Uh, hold on a second, exit full screen, what does that mean? Is that better? Okay, great. I'm gonna blow this up a little bit and get this to where we can see it. Okay, so we're done with red flags. Now we're gonna talk about uh, home treatment. Home treatment is rest, ice, a neoprene sleeve, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs if they're safe for you. Let's unpack these. Um, rest doesn't mean you can never get up. It means you get up to go to the bathroom, but if there's something you can avoid, you don't do it. Ice is an ice pack. You do as much as feels good. Neoprene sleeve is something you can order on Amazon or get at Walgreens. It's just something, uh, uh, the kind of things you see the athletes wearing. It's a knee sleeve. You pull it up and it supports your knee. And then uh, NSAIDs, if they're safe for you, are Aleve or Ibuprofen. 
And remember, NSAIDs taken long term have just hellacious uh, side effects. Starts out with ulcers, then heart attacks, then strokes, then kidney failure. I mean, just just uh, magnificently awful. So you kind of need to know from your doctor whether or not you're someone who's safe to take NSAIDs. Uh, helpful hack, if you have a cardiologist, don't take NSAIDs without, without getting the cardiologist's approval. But for the rest of you, for the rest of us, especially short term, NSAIDs are pretty safe. I do recommend if you're gonna take them, you take them with an acid blocker to protect your stomach. All right, um, so you're doing those things, and now you're, of course, you're going on Google, right? Da -da 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 -da. And you start reading about these hundreds of thousands of things. And you've had this pain, let's say you're two or three weeks into this, and all of a sudden, a week ago, you knew nothing, and now you have a PhD in knee pain, and you're just getting, should I get acupuncture? Should I have an MRI? When should I take glucosamine chondroitin? How about an anti inflammatory Like, what should I, there's, there's literally hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of things that are suggested and you have no idea what to do. And I'm gonna tell you right now, take a time out. For, with, when you're red flag negative, you should take those first three weeks, do the home care, which is the rest, ice, compression, elevation, and NSAIDs, and see if you get better. If you're not better at the end of those three weeks, then it's time to consider doing something else. But you usually, 90 plus percent of people are gonna be better at the end of the three weeks. So it makes sense just to give it that time. And if you're red flag negative, we're not losing anything by treating at home. It's, it should be perfectly safe. So um, how do you, you know, the, I think that one of the things that can go wrong here is you say three weeks and then you kind of, three weeks come and go and you forgot, and now your knee hurts and now you're accommodating and no. Mark it on your calendar. I felt this a week ago. I know that I need three weeks of home care. I'm red flag negative. I'm gonna mark my calendar for three weeks from the day it began. If I'm not better, I'm gonna have an appointment with my doctor the next day. You might even wanna, depending on your doctor, you might even wanna go ahead and make that appointment now and then cancel it if you're better, right? It's a good hack because that way you don't three weeks from now start making an appointment that you're gonna have to wait three weeks to have and now you're six weeks and you're just suffering for no reason, right? Sloppy, sloppy. And it's a choice, so don't, don't, don't choose to be sloppy. Make, a, a good hack would be, and you know, your, you know your life, you know your doctor, make that appointment now. Uh, well, what kind of doctor? Could you do a chiropractor? Definitely. Chiropractors are primary care doctors for the musculoskeletal system. MDs and DOs are primary care doctor, primary care family practice and internists are primary care doctors for all the systems. So if you want someone who does just the musculoskeletal system, you can go to a chiropractor, chiropractic doctor. If you want, if you have a good relationship and you love your primary care doctor, then you can certainly go to them. Either one is uh, good and it just sort of basically just depends on your situation. What's gonna happen though is important and you need to go into that visit with an expectation of what goes on because you know, doctors are uh, generally great people and highly motivated, but they're definitely people and people are not perfect. To get the perfect outcome, we need a partnership between you and your doctor. So what are the things that are gonna happen on this primary care visit that you need to go in there and communicate to your doctor? Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Here's what I expect is gonna happen today. Number one, they're gonna take your history and they're gonna ask you those red flag questions. So be ready to bang them out. You know, doc, no, have you had any fever, shakes, or chills? No, the doctor knows if you have a history of cancer. Um, have you been losing weight? Are you passing blood by mouth or, or uh, rectum? No, none of those things. And so they'll walk you through that, no red flags. Then they'll ask you about your pain. When did it begin? Did it begin with an accident? Look, they don't care if the accident was five years ago, right? They, they care, what they mean is, did it start when the pain began was the thing that happened the five minutes before an accident. They wanna know if you injured something or broke something because the choices are different if you injured something and then the pain started immediately or if it's long-term. And basically, it bends out into arthritis, which comes on slowly, yeah, maybe there was an accident five years ago, maybe you have rheumatoid arthritis, or maybe it's just good old fashioned osteoarthritis, which is 
the, by far the most common. But it could be arthritis, which comes on slowly, is worse in the morning, stiffness, all that. Or it could be an injury. And the two most common injuries are ACL tear, anterior cruciate ligament tear, ACL tear, or meniscal injury. The meniscus are two horseshoe-shaped pieces of cartilage that are uh, shock absorbers for your knee. Is there a PCL? Could it be a combination? Blah, blah, blah. Of course, all those things are true. But what I'm telling you is, instead of getting lost in the minutia and being like, oh my God, I could have one of a hundred different things. Yeah, you could, but there's like a 95% chance you have one of these three things. Arthritis or a tear of your ACL or your meniscus. So yeah, that's that's what the kind of questions your doctor is gonna ask you. Be, th be Have thought about it in advance. Don't go off on tangents with your doctor about the injury that you had six years ago from a car accident. They don't care, it's not relevant to this. Just that, yeah, I had an injury five years ago and now ever since then I've had progressive uh, pain in my knee which has gotten worse. That's the kind of information that they need. Okay, so they're gonna take your, they're gonna do the red flags, they're gonna take your history and then they're gonna examine you. And you know, this is the part where I think you, you have to be your own advocate. Sometimes the doctors sort of shuck off this part and from your point of view, you already knew your history before you went there. You already did your red flag survey on this site. You're really there for the exam. And in particular, there are two tests on the examination that are essential. And these two tests are very, very sensitive. To be honest, they're almost as good as an MRI. They're so sensitive. They're very sensitive for detecting a tear of your ACL or an injury to your, um, to your meniscus. The test for the ACL is Lachman's test. That's they have you bend your knee and they push you back and forth. The other one is for the meniscus and it's, it's, it's a little bit detailed. And if you go to my website, three minute knee exam, if your doctor didn't do this or you're not gonna see a doctor, I actually walk, get, walk you through how to do this yourself at home. You're not, I mean, hopefully you're gonna be good. You're not gonna be as good as your doctor, but you can do some, you can get some sense of it. Well, once you've done these two tests, you have everything that you need until to decide what, your doctor has everything that they need to decide whether or not you need to get imaging. And the imaging that you may need is an X-ray. X-ray is the next step. X-ray is crucial because it's going to determine everything that goes from then on. Let's go back to the graphic so that we can talk about it further. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my full screen here. And there we go. All right, so now this is a timeline, right? Here's where it starts, red flags and home treatment. Now we're at three weeks. We've seen the doctor, they did the x-ray, they did a physical, th they did uh, the, the history, physical examination and red flag survey again. Now they're gonna order an x-ray and physical therapy, regardless of the type of doctor. Those are the two things they're gonna do. So at three weeks, we're gonna get the x-ray. Well, uh, why not just get an MRI? Well, for two reasons. First, it's probably not necessary. The vast majority of cases are a strain. They're gonna get better over the next week or two, or they're gonna to respond to physical therapy. There's no need to see on MRI in order to make the next treatment step. But then the second reason is more defensive. Oftentimes, uh, MRIs are actually work against you in the early stages of musculoskeletal disease. And the reason is, let's say you injured your meniscus five years ago, and it healed up and there's really no problem, but the MRI actually shows the old injury. Well, now you have knee pain and the MRI shows a meniscus, so they're gonna refer you to a sports medicine surgeon who may do unnecessary surgery. That's how overutilization of healthcare happens. So uh, it's, it's really interesting. The evidence is really strong in the back. I actually don't know if it's the same sort of studies have been done in the knee, but long story short is you don't want a, an MRI at this phase if you don't need one because all it can do is lead to overutilization and it's not likely to affect your care. On the other hand, if you have an x-ray 
and the x-ray shows no arthritis or really mild arthritis, and your, not, your physical exam was positive for an ACL injury or possibly a meniscal injury, then you do need an MRI right now. Then you do need an MRI right now. But for most of us, the x-ray, the x-ray is going to be the, the thing that helps determine what happens next. What if the x-ray shows severe or moderate arthritis? Why don't I need an MRI? Well, it doesn't matter. If, if the arthritis is really severe, it doesn't matter whether there's an ACL tear and it doesn't really matter whether there's a meniscus injury. The arthritis is what's gonna determine the proper next steps in treatment. If you have severe arthritis and knee pain and an ACL tear, they're not gonna fix your ACL tear because you'd still have knee pain due to the severe arthritis, right? It just doesn't make sense. So the X-ray is your pivotal test. I think uh, so many people get advice from their family and the person says, you know, they didn't know what was wrong with me until I had an MRI. And they're actually exactly right, but they're, they're right for the wrong reason. It is true that some people, you, the only way you can see these soft tissue injuries, like the ACL tear or the meniscal tear, is on MRI. But that doesn't mean you need one at this phase. So they're right, but for the wrong reason. So um, right now, you get the x-ray and, and let's see what it shows. All right, so now we were at three weeks. We saw the doctor. We got the x-ray and the physical therapy. Physical therapy should go on for three weeks. At the end of the three weeks, if the physical therapist says, oh, we need to continue physical therapy for three more years, no. I mean, they really get three weeks. Physical therapy in rare situations needs to go six weeks, but for the most part, they're gonna get done with you what they can get done in three weeks. It's the same for the chiropractor. If you're seeing a good chiropractor, they're gonna do five treatments with you, and if you're not better after those five treatments, they're gonna refer you on or say, hey, I can't help you. So physical therapy or chiropractic, it's gonna go on for basically three weeks. Now you're at week six, and we've kind of gone in down two paths now based on the x-ray, right? Either we're on the path where we're dealing with arthritis, or we're on the path where we don't know what we're dealing with. Let's go back to the infographic and see what we should do next. Drum roll, please. Six weeks. Specialist time. Now, this is really, really important. If you have arthritis, you want to pick a pain management doctor and because your next step is going to be injection and possibly rhizotomy. If, you don't, if your x-ray did not show severe arthritis, then it's probably your meniscus or your ACL, and you want to go see an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon. And there's actually a third choice that I didn't put on this, and that is if you're not willing to consider radiofrequency ablation, then don't go to the pain management doctor. If burning the nerves doesn't appeal to you and you're like, yeah, I've had knee pain for six weeks, but this is the 10th time I've had it for six weeks. You know, it's been, this has been going on for years. Then you really probably don't want to consider, if you're sort of resigned to, look, the x-ray shows severe arthritis, I know I'm headed for a total knee replacement, then just go see the, the knee replacement surgeon. Either way, one of those three doctors, the pain management doctor, if you have arthritis and you're considering rhizotomy, the total knee replacement surgeon, if you have arthritis but you won't consider rhizotomy, you just wanna get on with it. Either way, they're gonna give you a steroid shot because sometimes that just settles it down and you're good for a long time and sometimes a long, long time. They can also consider other kinds of shots. They can consider a stem cell derived protein injection or the Synvisc hyaluronic acid. There's now like five of them. They, you flex, they, flex, they've got all kinds of names. I don't even know them. But um, I also, as far as I can tell, they're largely equivalent. The doctors I work with seem to, to, be, to say they go by the insurance. If the insurance will pay for this one, and these things are very expensive, then you go for that one. If the insurance will pay for the other one, then you go for the other one. So it's kind of like a delivery issue, which is totally fine if the products are equivalent. And uh, for all we know, they seem to be equivalent. So you've got these three options for injection, steroid, which lasts about 100 hours, or the uh, hyaluronic acid, Synvisc, Flexa, et cetera, 
or you can get a stem cell derived injection. Stem cell derived actually has really good data and more, it's a little more anecdotal, but it is not, um, not paid for by insurance and you're looking at thousands of dollars for that injection. What about PRP? That's in the same stem cell derived category. It's just you are the source of the stem cells. If they're gonna get the stem cells by drawing your blood, spinning it down into platelets, then PRP is your version of stem cell derived protein. Keep in mind, since it's coming from you, if you're over 30, your stem cell population is going down, so you're a crap donor, right? The, I mean, probably the reason you didn't heal up in the first place was you don't have enough stem cells. So if you're not a young high school intercollegiate, or intercollegiate track and field athlete, PRP is probably not the way to go for you. You don't want to use yourself as the donor. You want to use a donor that has great stem cells, and that would be amnion-derived uh, amnion derived proteins, growth factors, hundreds of growth factors, and um, discarded amnion tissue from, from afterbirth. It's stuff that's not going to be used for anything else and can be cultured up safely and used for injection. So something else to consider. By the way, of course, we have separate videos on all these things. If you want to go through uh, stem cell-derived protein injection, ver growth factor injection versus, um, versus uh, hyaluronic acid, please watch our video from our um, uh, most popular download series. It's, uh, it will go through the, that choice in considerable detail. All right, so now we're nine weeks and we've had an injection and uh, we're gonna go back to the specialist and it's time to decide. If you have arthritis, you're a candidate for genicular nerve block and radiofrequency ablation. If the idea of burning your nerves is crazy for you, uh, or if you just want to get it over with, then move on and uh, consider, and it's time to see the joint replacement surgeon to talk about knee replacement. Genicular nerve block is really cool. We covered this on Best Practice Live last week in my interview with Dr. Anne-Cherie Fox. Really cool option, about 65% pain relief in a similar percentage of people. It lasts uh, for around a year. So it's not permanent, but it is a good temporary fix and uh, moderately to highly effective. Definitely, I think, something to consider and uh, often overlooked, often overlooked. So something you can, you can suggest to your doctor. Hey, what about RFA for my knee? Doctor might say, what? Do they do RFA for the knee? Yeah, doc, no. And you can make sure that you get the best treatment um, and get the treatment that you deserve and what's coming to you. All right, so now let's say we do get to 12 weeks and we're in the arthritis category. Uh, it's time for a total, it's time for a knee replacement. There are partial and total knee replacements. About 96% end up being total. The partials are people who have uh, only one of the three compartments of the knee is diseased. There are three compartments, the patellofemoral space, the inside and the outside. If only one is effective, affected, you can have a partial knee replacement. Otherwise, you have to have a total knee replacement. And I mean, the odds are 96% chance it's gonna to be total knee replacement. All right, let's go back in time and talk about, we just did arthritis from six weeks to 12 weeks, but now we're gonna zip back in time and say, what's the other one? So let's say that x-ray at three weeks did not show arthritis. It's uh, arthritis, by the way, if you want to know whether you're arthritis or not, which path you're on, look at your x-ray report. Here's a healthy hack. Look at your x-ray report. The radiologist should grade the arthritis. They'll describe it and they'll use words which give away whether it's grade zero, absolutely no arthritis, grade one, which is some joint space narrowing and maybe, maybe some bone spurs, grade two, which is that same stuff, only worse, Grade three or grade four, that's moderate to severe, which is the joint space is collapsing in severe, it's bone on bone. And then bone spurs are forming and it's kind of progressing. So if you're none, no arthritis, good for you, grade zero, or you're minimal, grade one, um, then, uh, or I'm sorry, grade, two, grade one or grade two, then you should say, okay, it's not arthritis. Because mild arthritis or no arthritis should have gotten better by now but my knee still hurts and I'm six weeks out. 
we don't know what the heck's going on here. We don't know what's going on. So we got to get an MRI. And the MRI may show a soft tissue injury. It could show an injury to the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, or one of the meniscuses. Once you get out here to 12 weeks, if you still are having severe pain, you're a candidate then for arthroscopic, if it's a meniscus, you're a candidate for arthroscopic clean out of the meniscus. By the way, there's a way on the symptoms that you can, you can think it's probably a meniscus, and that's clicking, popping, and locking. Clicking, pop, and lock. It's like the Rice Krispie guys, lock, clock, and clip. But um, clicking, popping, and locking, if that's what your knee is doing a lot of, then it's a meniscus. It's probably a meniscus, confirmed by MRI. The orthopedic surgeon can go in there and clean it out, and uh, it feels a lot better. It probably, that, that operation is called meniscectomy. Probably doesn't change long-term how you're gonna do. So uh, they've actually done some studies where they randomized people, very much like the herniated disc studies. It actually didn't matter long-term whether you cleaned it out or not, but holy cow, they felt better immediately after surgery. So it's a palliative surgery, arthroscopic meniscectomy. It relieves pain but it doesn't cure the problem. But you know, nothing wrong with feeling better, right? Nothing wrong, nothing, ain't nothing wrong with feeling better. So arthroscopic meniscectomy. If you're under 50, which is young in medical, in this case, in medis, medical terms, then you, uh, and you have certain kinds of meniscal tears, like a bucket handle tear, then you may be a candidate for meniscal repair. Meniscectomy is where they go in and roto-rooter clean it out Meniscal repair is they go in and fix it. They either sew up the tear or they tack it down. They, they make it better. But only younger people and people with good blood supply and certain types of tears, certain geometries of tears are candidates. The ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, on the other hand, if you have a complete tear, your knee is unstable and you need to have it reconstructed. And you're not going to want to because it's like six months of, of, um, of uh, recovery, crap ton of physical therapy. So it's a, it's a big deal to have an ACL reconstruction, but you need to have it done, and I'll tell you why. First of all, there's two things that you're gonna read that are, that are both not true. They're kachui. Kachui! Number one, um, don't have it reconstructed, just have it repaired. You know, we did that. The orthopedic surgeons did that for decades. It was, the results were terrible. There was a higher incidence of, of recurrent tears, and then when it tears the second time, you have to start over. Hopefully one day, we're gonna have uh, some brilliant way to reconstruct these, to repair and not reconstruct the ACL. But as far as I know, today ain't that day. If I'm wrong, uh, write in the comments and let me know. I'd love to hear the data. Show me the data. You know that, that agent from, uh, what was that movie where he says, show me the money. Well, I'm gonna say, show me the data. When you show me the data on that, I would love to see it, but uh, we're, we're not there today as far as I know. The reason it takes so long to heal is that the graft has bone on one end, bone on the other, and then they graft the bone in to make the ligament hold, but that means the bone has to heal. Remember when that kid broke their arm in first grade? Actually, that was me. I broke both arms at different, different times, but how long did it take to heal? six to 12 weeks, right? Bone heals slowly. It heals, and it heals completely, but it's slow. It's six to 12 weeks, and so that has to heal, and then you have to start the rehab, and that's where, all, so you gotta wait, and then you do this extensive rehab. Ends up being about six months for ACL reconstruction, which is, which is a long time. Big deal, big deal. All right, so that's the, those are the two, that's where the pathways diverge at six weeks between arthritis and soft tissue injury, not arthritis. But what we've gone over is the expected treatment, the doctor recommended treatment of knee pain. Look, people, if you're not on this time course, you're not getting proper care. What are you doing? If you're not on this bus, you're on the wrong bus. <laughs> get, get on the right bus, get on the bus. This is what the, this is, these are the protocols that uh, you should be following to get better. And it takes 12 weeks. It doesn't take 120. I mean, how many people have had knee pain for five years? Well, which is longer? Five, is five years longer than 12 weeks? Yes. <laughs> you know, five years is 250 weeks. 
or more, right? 200, 200, 300, almost 300 weeks. So no, that, that's, you know, it's 12 weeks. Get it done. I'm just, I'm just amazed in my life. I, I, it happens to me all the time that I'll be at a dinner party and somebody will start talking about their knee pain or their hip or their whatever. And they'll talk about how they injured it years ago and how they're having all these problems. And it's been five years and now they can't do this and that and the other thing. And I mean, more often than not, this person has is wealthy enough to get, there's no financial problem getting all the care they need. They can afford their co-insurance, they can afford their copay, they can afford their deductible. They are smart. I mean, I'm not gonna hang out with dumb people, right? Well, they're smart and they're capable and they're often doctors. Well, a lot of my friends are doctors and they're, they're getting the wrong care. And it's just such a mystery to me Every time I say to them, gosh, you know, there's a protocol for this. And they're like, what? And then, and, and then of course, I mean, they've heard this before. Then I tell them the protocol. And then they still have some, some crazy issue. And I'll tell you what it is. It's emotional. It's, it's, it, it can be financial. It can be logistical. It can be you were caring for your elderly parent or your injured spouse and you know, you were delayed and okay, yeah, fine. Or you didn't have insurance, it's financial, great, I get it. But if it's not one of those things, it's emotional. And I think it it starts out with that fear of, am I ever gonna be the same? And that's where you take that red flag survey. And then it's that anxiety about being overwhelmed with choices and making the wrong choice. Give it three weeks, rest, ice, compression, elevation, NSAIDs. If those don't work, get an x-ray. Look at that x-ray report. If that x-ray report says it's arthritis, then you're on one path. If it's not arthritis, then you're on the other and you're gonna need an MRI. And then we get into just basically completing the job, executing the task. You gotta schedule these things. You gotta, you gotta write each one of these three weeks. Go look back at this infographic and schedule these, these things every three weeks so that you kind of keep yourself on target. Someday I'm gonna develop an app where you start that app on day one. I'm gonna get knee treatment, and then the app reminds you, hey, Dan, you were supposed to have an x-ray, but you didn't, are you better? You know, so it's almost like we need an app for this, but until we get that, let's just, you know, do it yourself. Do it manually, do your own scheduling. Um, you can get better. These are evidence-based treatments, they really work. They end with you getting back into the things you love, getting back to running, back to being with the grandkids or the kids, getting back to being able to take vacations. These are the things that um, matter in our lives. And if you follow the right 12-week treatment path, you can be 12 weeks away from living a better, fuller, happier life. Uh, thanks for listening today. A little bit of a rant, <laughs> but I'm passionate about this. I really want you to get better. I really want you to do the things that make you better. It just drives me crazy that healthcare delivery would keep us from leading a full life. It, it took so many brilliant people to work all this stuff out, and then we just dumb it up in the way we carry it out. I just don't get it. Sad. But anyway, we're going to make it better. Now you know, and knowledge is power. So use your power. Get better, and have a great day. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow on Best Practice Live. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, there are three ways to ask. Leave a comment on any of our social channels, click the link to our website and complete the submission form, or call us at 602-256-2525. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server. Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health. Lastly, be sure to check out new episodes every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we answer all your questions.